Hi, I'm Doki and this is Okie Doki Boki and today I'm doing my first library check-in in like 10 months, I think? Yeah, I think it's 10 months. So for those of you who are new to the channel, I used to do these library check-ins where I would go to the library, get some books, talk about the books that I checked out, talk about what books I returned, you know, just like a nice little wrap up of things I've read lately and also kind of like a sorta TBR, like things that I might be reading soon because yeah, I like the library, it's awesome. But for the past year, I have been traveling quite a bit. So from uh, end of August to December, I was in Oslo in Norway. And then from January to June, I was in Austin, Texas. And it was very fun to do all of this traveling, but I just was not going to the library as much in that time. I didn't get a library card while I was in Oslo because I was a little bit lazy to figure out how to do it. So I just didn't really get to check out any books while I was there in Austin. I actually Actually did go to the library quite a few times thanks to my in-laws and their library card but I just was a little lazy about doing library check-ins but I am back home now so I am so excited to be able to go back to my home library I love it so much they're really awesome it's so nice to be able to get so many books so quickly here through the Western Mass like library consortium system. So yeah, I'm so excited to do one of these library check-in videos for the first time again in so long. Before I do that though, I also want to talk about something else that was really exciting lately and that was BookNet Fest uh, because that happened last weekend at least last weekend to when I was filming this. So BookNet Fest is an event that's put together for like bookish internet creators. It's organized by Mari from My Name is Mari Nez and Sam from Thoughts on Tomes. And I love BookNet Fest. I think I've been going ever since the second one. So really that was the second and third one. And then because of COVID, they weren't really able to do it for a while. And I was really sad because I was like, is BookNet Fest coming back or not? And so when I found out that it is coming back, I was really excited because it is my favorite event. The thing that I love the most about BookNet Fest is the way that even though like I am a smaller creator and I like go in every time with a lot of imposter syndrome about like being a smaller creator and talking to people about booktube like even though I've been doing this for a while like you know there's just like that little bit of just like insecurity of like why would anyone want to listen to me like I've never actually had the experience of being at booknet fest and having someone be like why would anyone want to listen to her like because people are just really nice and open and seem to be just like, excited to talk to other people who like to talk about books on the internet like I think there's just something really cool about the fact that we get to like gather in a space and just be little book nerds together so yeah I always come out of booknet fest feeling like validated in the fact that I do this and also like invigorated and inspired so I think that's like part of the energy for today is like I'm back home but I'm also I'm coming back from booknet fest so I just feel like all this like creative kind of like I gotta make more things about books. The other thing about booknet fest that I always really love is how much thought goes into the panels so I think like there's just a way that they manage to construct the panels that takes these conversations that we have online and does them in person in a way that feels like a I actually feel like I can start to dive deeper into the a lot of the ideas that are like percolating in the back of my head because A, it's in person, so it's just a different context from doing things online, and B, it's a conversation. So you're with the people on the panel or you're listening to people on the panel and there's just like some kind of like vibe of like, you know, you might talk to the people at the table, you might talk to people um, after the panel. There's just something about that conversational aspect to it that I think gives these conversations something that you can't get if you're just having them online and so i've always really really loved being at booknet fest to listen to panels and also to be at panels there are conversations that i've had like from years ago like i still think about the authorial intent panel that we did like way back because i just it, it did so much to help me think through some of the weird contradictions and complications that I had had in my head about how we think about authorial intent and how we talk about it online. And so that was like a thing that I, I, I still think about. And I feel like the panels that I was on this year are things that I'm gonna still be thinking about. I was on four panels. I was on the hobby burnout panel, the rise of anti-intellectualism, your problematic fave, and this panel is canceled, which was not canceled, but like that was the name of the panel. And so 
there was like, especially with those last three, there was kind of like a lot of threads that ran through them. So uh, thank you to everyone who was patient and like willing to listen to me to talk about similar ideas across all three of these panels because it was really fun. There were different people on these different panels, except for me, who like you all had to listen to multiple times if you were there. Um, so being able to kind of grapple with different aspects of like uh, how we talk about problematic things, how we talk about cancellation, how we read and talk about books critically online through these different lenses of these different panels for me was super, super gratifying. I, I got a lot out of that experience. And then the, the other uh, panel that I was on, the Hobby Burnout, that was really interesting for me to be on um, because I think the first panel I ever did for BookNet Fest my first year, I think was about balancing booktube as a hobby. So hobby burnout the panel kind of covered a lot of similar ideas and it was interesting coming back to those ideas now a few years later because there's just been so much in my life that has changed since then like i am older maybe like slightly wiser but like i've also like been through shit. and so especially for me like in the past few years having had my experiences with miscarriages that were like really taking huge toll on me physically and emotionally like the burnout that I experienced during that time was a very different type of burnout than I, the, the burnout that I, I've experienced before, which was more just like a function of like, I'm finding my work-life balance as someone who was like really committed to a strong work identity for a long time and then had to kind of change my ideas around how I wanted to approach work. And also someone who was going from doing booktube as a hobby to someone who writes YouTube videos for a living now, like that's like a very separate set of things to balance compared to like physically and emotionally, I am in a I am in a space right now where like this thing as a hobby has been both something that has really, really helped me. Um, like being able to make videos where I talk about my miscarriage was something that actually meant a lot to me at the time. But also like the way that the hobby was also something that I couldn't do as much either a lot of the times because I was tired. <laughs> like I was just mentally kind of burnt out. <laughs> like I just couldn't do it. And so yeah, it, it was it was a really, really fun experience to be on that panel. I mean, it was we like started off being like, I'm excited to be on this panel about burnout because there is something contradictory about that, but there is something nice about being able to talk about a lot of those feelings. It also got me thinking about the fact that like, I'm very committed to the idea of like, what was right for me with this channel was to like, not really try to be a big booktuber for a lot of reasons. I don't know if I ever would have been particularly good at it, but also just like for me, it felt much more sustainable in the long term. And one of the things that I've been thinking about since that panel, Sam had asked this question about like, do you ever really feel like pressure from the algorithm as this thing to like perform to? And personally, I don't because I just have never really approached this channel in a way where like I have been concerned about what the algorithm wants for me because it's just like not really aligned with my goals. But with that said, the thing that I've been thinking about since I like, since I did that panel is like, even though there are like conscious choices I have made to make this channel more sustainable for me, that doesn't necessarily save you from burnout. At the end of the day, I have still had periods where I've been like, I just can't do this channel as much, right? Like, again, like I said, like this past, these past few years, I just like haven't been able to make as much because of stuff that was going on outside of this. Like you can set these things up to make the channel more sustainable for yourself, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're never gonna burn out. I, I think in some ways, like the way that you burn out though is a function of the way that you set up the channel for yourself. And so there are ways that this channel became difficult for me to do because of the things that were still my goal. Like I really liked the idea of making these in-depth discussion-y kind of videos, but also like when it came to burning out, it, like that was sort of what my burnout like ultimately looked like was not being able to make those kinds of videos because it was like, oh my God, I have to sit down. I have to organize my thoughts. I have to like write up a whole thing. Like it just became tiring. So you can like have a clear set of ideas for what you want to do with booktube with any other kind of hobby, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to burn out. It's just going to be the thing that like shapes what your burnout looks like. And also I think determines what coming back from burnout will look like, I think. Anyways, that was something that I just like sort of had in the back of my mind, kind of thinking about that panel, because I think you, whenever you do a panel, like, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for anyone else, but I always come out of the panels feeling like, oh my God, I should have said X, Y, and Z. I should have said this, I should have said that. And so like, that was the thing that I kind of felt like 
I should have said, but couldn't really say in the moment because I was still like thinking through things. But yeah, anyways, thanks for letting me say it now. I love BookNetFest. Highly, highly recommend checking it out. I'll link, I'll leave links to like some of the BookNetFest socials and stuff down below because I think it's such a good event. And BookNetFest done, let's do the library check-in. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about are books that I haven't read yet. There are a few that I am currently in the middle of reading, but I have nothing to like, give concrete thoughts about. First up, the books that I'm currently reading for the BookTube prize, the nonfiction round, the semifinals that are happening right now. Um, I have already read two of the books that are in my group for this section because I read them for the quarterfinals, so they are not currently checked out from the library, so these are the rest that I have. So the one that I'm currently reading is Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and on the Health of Our Nation by Linda Villarosa. Um, she is a former, or she is a health writer, I believe now she, she's written this article for the New York Times about racism in, um, and maternal mortality in America. And so this is her book that's sort of like expanding on all of that. Um, so yeah, currently reading it. I cannot give my thoughts on any of these books yet because uh, I'm still in the middle of judging. The next up is His Name is George Floyd by Robert Samuels and Tolu Arunipa. And then we've got Sandy Hook, An American Tragedy and the Battle for Truth by Elizabeth Williamson. And then the last one that I have for the book two prize checked out is An Immense World by Ed Young, uh, <laughs> which like of all of these books, like Ed Young is probably the author that I am most familiar with. I've talked about him a bunch on my channel before because like, he is a science writer whose like work really got me wanting to do science writing and to do it kind of in the way that I do it. So uh, yeah, so this is a book that I had been wanting to read in general. So I will be reading it now for the book two prize. I'm probably not gonna end up doing a recap of my quarterfinals reading just because I think by the time that I'm done with like the semifinals, I'm gonna feel like, good and focused on these books and just talking about them. Um, but I will say that in general, my experience with the semifinals was like pretty good. There weren't that many books where I was like, notably like super critical of, especially when I compare it to previous years where I've ended up in sections where there are books where I'm like, I really do not like this book. The ones that I didn't like in that, that section were really more books that I was just like, these are not, books that I am personally interested in, but there was nothing execution wise that really stood out to me as bad, given what those books were trying to do. So I'm curious to see how that's gonna ha like play out for the semifinals. Like, am I just in a more chill place? Not really, I don't think I'm in a more chill place overall. It might just be that maybe the books this year have like resonated with me or on a very different way. It might just be that the books this year are kind of like this. We'll see. We'll see in a, we'll see in a month or two or whatever when I when I actually get to talking about these books. And the next up is my stack of fiction. So some of these I am currently in the middle of reading, and some I will hopefully get to soon. So starting with the the two that I haven't been reading yet. The first is Stories of Your Life by Ted Chiang, uh, because uh, everyone talks about how good Ted Chiang is, and I just like have yet to read one of his short stories, and I don't know why. It just like, it keeps not happening. I keep checking out his short story collections because everyone talks about how good they are and then just like not getting a chance to sit down with them. I might get to a point where I just kind of commit to like reading one story every few days or something just so that I finally do this. Then we have YN by Esther Yee. I don't know if it's supposed to be YN or your name because this is about like your name here, insert fanfic. Uh, basically, I checked this out because I am in the mood for anything that's like exploring fandom and the weirdness of fandom right now. Our nonfiction book club book pick actually for July is um, Everything I Need I Get From You, which is about fandom and the internet, largely through a One Direction fandom. So I'm really excited to talk about that with Nicole, but I'm also very curious about a fictional take on fandom. So this book is supposed to be, I think about a girl who gets very obsessed with a Korean boy band member. 
uh, which I like have not really delved heavily into like Korean fandom in general. Like I really like Taemin and like that's sort of the extent to which I like engage with like K-pop fandom and maybe like a few other bands. Like I do listen to K-pop. I just like have never really delved heavily into the fandom side because it kind of seems like a lot and I've already got enough going on in my life with like Taylor Swift and Vanderpump Rules. So like I, I just don't have room in my life for another fandom. Um, but yeah. I'm really curious about this book. Then we have the three books that I am currently in the middle of reading of in some form or another. Um, so Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Like a lot of people have been talking about this book. I haven't been reading the physical copy. I actually have it on audiobook and I started listening to it last summer and then just kind of put it aside and need to get back into it. Uh, it's about basically game makers. And so I really, really enjoyed listening to it, especially because of like the era that it's set in and the set, like it's uh, the characters at the center of the book are like studying in Boston, Cambridge area. So it's like fun to like see a lot of these little things that I know from the area, but also in the context of gaming, which I don't really know much about. Like I am not a big game, video game player, computer game player. One of the things that I was really enjoying about this book was the way that it portrayed um, game making and game storytelling, because that's something that I don't really fully appreciate. So I am planning to get back to this book and I think it will be really fun when I do. Um, but yeah, so I basically checked out the physical copy from the library because I was like, maybe I'll do the thing where I go back and forth between audiobook and physical book, which sometimes helps me finish the books that I'm reading. And then my last two books, I basically spent last night debating between whether or not I wanted to read Solomon's Crown by Natasha Siegel or Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. These are both books that I feel like within their respective spheres have gotten a lot of hype. So Solomon's Crown, I actually first heard about, um, I think from a New York Times um, recommendations, or like romance recommendations article. Solomon's Crown is set in 12th century Europe. It's a romance between Richard the Lionheart and Philip, uh, King Philip of France. But like the author's note in the beginning makes it very clear that like these two historical figures are really just being kind of used for the way that like she can use the architecture of everyone around them. So like even though that this is based on two actual people who lived, the only reason she's really using them is so that she can have this basic conflict set up by everything that has ex existed in the history of these characters. In terms of like the allegiances, the family dynamics, the complications of like the politics, like all of that is there in the background. But overall, this book is taking massive, massive liberties with history. So then the other book that I was debating reading last night, uh, Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. This is a super hyped release uh, <laughs> that came out recently. So I feel like a lot of people have heard about it, but it's basically about this white woman who writes books and then decides to uh, steal the manuscript of her uh, Chinese friend who has been super successful and also who's kind of died in a freak accident. And she steals her manuscript co-ops an Asian identity of her own to try to sell it. And I think things will ensue. So I read the first chapters of both of these last night. I decided to go with Solomon's Crown just because it's due sooner. So I was like, I should probably finish this first. And I will say that both chapters, like the first chapter experience of both of these were a little rocky for me. Solomon's Crown, like, it's based on these historical characters, right? And so I think I kind of went into this book with this expectation of like that epic courtly feel that you expect from a book that is going to take on epic courtly figures in history, which maybe is sort of like an unfair expectation to put on the book and especially one that is not super thick, right? Like this is what, like 346 pages? 339, this is like less than 350 pages. It is not a super long book. So I feel like I should have known just from looking at it that it is not gonna be that kind of big epic book. So starting it off, it felt a little like, a little disappointing at first, just because I realized it was not gonna be what I was wanting it to be. But I'm trying to work on this thing where I stop holding books to the expectations of things that they have not necessarily promised to be and instead focus on what they are actually trying to be. And the thing that I have been really enjoying about this book now that I have been a little bit more patient with it is that it is very, very character focused. It is very focused on who Philip and who Richard are in this weird, complicated dynamic that they have to have as two major figures in their respective countries and these countries that are at odds with each other. And also 
like two characters who have had an enormous amount of responsibility placed on them just by accident of birth and then later for Richard through accidents of disease that kind of move him up the charts a little in the hierarchy that he was not necessarily expecting. There is still a part of me that wants to read like the 800 page version of this book because I would love to see a lot of the things in the background get fleshed out more but now that I've been able to kind of appreciate this book for what it is I'm really enjoying the ride and I think that it manages to pull off something that is very complicated in its romance and the way that it integrates politics into that, especially when you see the way that these characters and particularly Philip is having to grapple with what is essentially a conflict of interest, <laughs> like the, the fact that he is uh, approaching this relationship with a guy who is going to be at turns his ally and at other turns his enemy. It's it's a complicated dynamic and I'm I'm enjoying it for what it is. I'm like about halfway through. Um, I think I'm more than halfway through. So I'll probably finish this in the next few days because it has been a very, very fast read and I want to see what happens. And then Yellow Face, I also read the first chapter of and it lost to Solomon's crown last night on the technicality of due dates. The first chapter did have sort of a mixed thing for me. I felt like it did a really good job of moving things quickly and making me really invested in what's going to happen because the main perspective is terrible. <laughs> like we're, we're hearing the story from June's perspective. She is the white woman who is going to basically uh, steal a manuscript. So she is delightfully awful. Actually, I shouldn't say delightfully, but I will say that I think that Kwong took a lot of delight in writing from her perspective because she just lets it be terrible. And I love a book that just like fully embraces the awfulness of its characters and the weirdness of its premise. And this is a book that at least from the beginning seems to be doing that. So that first chapter did a lot to draw me in because it's like moving quickly and it's clearly going to go to a weird chaotic place, both of which I really appreciate. At the same time, as much as I appreciated the way that the book does not hold back from how like petty and resentful June is, there were times where I felt like the exposition just kind of dragged on in that regard where I was sort of like, I get it. And it's not that I like feel like I don't want to know that June is like horrible in this way, but it's just like, it, it starts to drag a little bit in the beginning. And I think in particular, the reason why it felt like it was dragging is because it was dwelling in details that I think writers like love to dwell in about writing and publishing. Like all of these things about like advances and I don't know, book deals and right, I don't know, just stuff like that, that I think are important, but just like I felt like I did not need quite as much as I got. And the excess started to feel like it was dragging on the things that were actually happening because we spend this first chapter like in this experience with June and Athena where they are like getting together. Athena's had this like Netflix deal, they're celebrating, but also June's resentful. And so like we spend a lot of time dwelling in her resentment, which means that she spends a lot of time explaining the background of their experience together. And so you just spend a lot of time out of that immediate moment. And it's not that I think that that's wrong or bad. It's just for one chapter, the, the one chapter that I read, it meant that I was a little like bored at times even though when it finally picked back up I was like fully in but that's one chapter there's only one chapter it is the only chapter I have to talk about and I'm still talking about it so clearly it made an impression so I think when I return to this book it'll be uh hopefully a wild ride so yeah those are my library books that I have currently checked out and I'm excited to get to them. If you guys have thoughts about any of those books, any of them that you have in particular loved, let me know. I will not be able to commiserate with you on any of those nonfiction books for a while because again, I'm reading them for the booktube prize. So I'll share my thoughts on those later. Um, but yeah, thanks so much you guys for watching. I'm so glad to be back home. I don't know why being home feels like a return to the channel when I was still making content while I was traveling, but I just, I don't know. I'm happy to be home either way. So yeah, thanks you guys for watching and bye.